Hello everyone, in this video I'm going to focus on concepts related to material theory that may be very useful to those who use finite element solvers just like ANSYS and LSDINA while simulating metal forming processes. Let me introduce myself first, I'm Amr Shaban and I'm an assistant professor at Faculty of Engineering in Shams University from Egypt and I'm the founder of the Zion Online Academy. The Zion Online Academy is an online academy that will introduce 16 online course for mechanical engineering on Udemy and to the moment of the recording, we have already 3,086 students that have enrolled in our courses from 86 countries all over the world. Let us start with a very basic question. Why you are making a simulation for the metal forming process from the first place? Well, in my opinion, I think we need to predict the material behavior during the metal forming process and check whether it will fail or it will succeed. So we have two choices first choice is to make this experimentally and this will be costly in time and effort and the other choice is to make the numerical simulation using one of the finite element solvers just like LS Dyna. So the main purpose of the finite element solver here is to predict the material behavior during the metaforming process and to check whether this material will fail or the metaforming process will succeed. So what we need to do here in this is to define a clear material failure criteria to use while making the simulation. Well, let's start with the basic concepts related to stresses. We have two kinds of stresses. The normal stress that may be due to normal force, tension or compression, or may be due to bending moment just like this application. On the other side, we have the shear stress that may be due to shear force or may be due to torque like most of power transmission elements applications. But in most of real life application, if we started an infinitesimal element for material, we may find out that it's exposed to six components of stresses. Sigma x, sigma y, sigma z, three components of normal stresses, and three components of shear stress, tau x, y, tau x, z, and tau y, z. Here is the question. If we need an information, any information about a material, we are going to make a tensile test, experimental tensile test. Okay. From the experimental tensile test, we can find out the Young's modulus, the yield stress, the UTS, or the ultimate tensile stress, the fracture, the percentage of ligation, and other information. But the question is, this experimental tensile test is a state of any axial state of stress. Can we use those information while we study a general state of stress or a triaxial state of stress? Okay, the answer is yes and no. Yes, we can use those information, but no, we cannot use it directly. Okay, so that's why we need to study the material failure theories, just like Rankine, Tresca, Van Mises, Moore, and other series of material failure. The material failure here are the fa is a failure from the concept of the design. When we make a design of a structure, we need to make sure that the, this structure will not approach the yield. But if we are talking about a metal forming process, we need to make sure that the stress will exceed the yield. So we need to define clearly the criteria of failure here, whether we are making a design of a structure under a static load or we are making a design of a metal forming process. A tip here for those who use finite element solvers. You may notice that ANSYS, for example, do not, does not accept values of a stress strain in the engineering values. So we need to convert those engineering values to the true values using those formulas. Another thing, you may notice that the ANSYS and the Dyna accept the EPS or the equivalent plastic strain not the total strain generated from the experimental tensile test. So there is another formula to convert this total strain to the EPS or equivalent plastic strain. Well, before studying the material failure criteria, we should first study the stress transformation concepts and especially the Mohr circle. If we have a structure like this exposed to a concentrated load B and a uniform distributed load Q, and we have the dimensions of the structure like this, we can use the stress analysis concepts to find out the pendant moment diagram, from which we can find the stress distribution upon any cross section of the structure. And we can also find the state of stress upon any point of the structure. So, if we have here the initial stress state, we can plot sigma x with tau xy 
and sigma y was negative di xy, just like this. This is the Mohr circle. So, by plotting sigma x tau xy, sigma y, negative tau xy, we can have the two, two points. So, the Mohr circle, here we have the x-axis presenting the normal stress and the y-axis presenting the shear stress. By connecting those two points together, it will intersect with the x-axis with the point. This is a sigma average. We can use the stress transformation concept to find out the principal plane, the plane upon which we have only normal stresses and the shear stress is zero. Those stress or those normal stress in the principal plane is called the principal stresses. The maximum value is sigma 1, the maximum principal stress, and the minimum value, sigma 2, is the minimum principal stress. By rotating this point or this line until reaching the x-axis, we find out that we rotate to with uh, angle theta, theta p. So theta p is the angle of the principal plane measured from the plane of the initial stress. Be careful, because the angle here in the Mohr circle is twice the actual angle. We can also use the stress transformation constant on Mohr circle to find out the maximum shear stress plane. The maximum shear stress is the plane that has the shear stress as the maximum value, and the normal stress in this case will be the sigma average. Okay, so this is what Mohr circle is all about. We can now study the case of material failure. We have two, three material failure concepts, Rankine, Tresca, and von Mises. Those are scientists that have introduced theories to check whether the material will fail or not. The first criteria here is Rankine, or also called the maximum principal stress. He plotted a graph between sigma 1 and sigma 2, the principal stress sigma 1 and the minimum principal stress sigma 2. He also drew a square, and this square is a yielding surface. Any point that is plotted sigma 1, sigma 2, that is inside this square is considered safe, while any point on the edge or beyond the edge is considered a failure point, because it, it exceeds the yield for sure. Rankine depends on that is a principal plane is a plane that have no shear, and the maximum principal normal stress in this plane can be compared with the yield stress generated from the experimental tensile test. Rankine can be used for brittle materials and it is not recommended for the ductile material. On the other side, for ductile materials, it is recommended to use Tresca and von Mises. Tresca and von Mises are so similar criteria. However, everyone have generated a shape of the yielding surface. So Tresca, for example, depends on sigma 1 minus sigma 2 is less than or equal sigma yield, the yield stress while sigma 1 minus sigma 2 is a deviatoric term of the stresses. So, post Tresca and von Mises ignore the hydrostatic term of the stresses. Okay, so the other criteria here for ductile material is von Mises. It depends on this formula, and this is formula of parabola. So, we can find out that the yielding surface in case of von Mises with the red profile is a case of parabola. Tresca may be clear here that it's more conservative compared to von Mises, but just like Rankine, just plot sigma 1 and sigma 2 and check if it is inside the yield surface, this is very heavy, and if it is outside the yield surface, it means it will fail. Okay, this is another presentation of how Tresca and von Mises yielding criteria work. This is a 3D plot of sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3 which are the normal stress components. This line presents the case of sigma 1 equals sigma 2 equals sigma 3. And this is the case of that all stresses, all the normal stresses, are equal. This case is called the hydrostatic axis. As we said previously, we have two components of the stresses. Hydrostatic stress that causes volume change and the deviatoric stress that causes angular distortion. And this is the important stress type. That's why Tresca and von Mises both focused on this term, the deviatoric term of the stress. This plane in blue is a plan of the deviatoric plane, where sigma 1 plus sigma 2 plus sigma 3 must be equal to zero. You may now understand why in the end of any design problem, design of any structure under a static load, 
we compare the state of stress with sigma yield over 2n or 0.6 sigma yield over n. Sigma yield over 2n or 0.5 sigma yield over n is according to the Tresca. And on the other side, if you find the formula just like 0.6 sigma yield over n, that means that we use the von Mises yielding criteria. Let's now turn back to the metal forming process as discussed previously in the beginning of the video. What if you are making a simulation for a metal forming process such as stamping as shown in this figure? If we study the infinitesimal element here in the structure or here in the structure, we can find out that the state of stress varies between uniaxial to biaxial. So there are an arbitrary state of stress here distributed along this sheet metal. So, to make the simulation, we need to clearly define the material failure criteria. As we mentioned previously, all information related to a certain material can be obtained by an experimental tensile test. The UTS, for example, or the ultimate tensile strength at which the necking occurs cannot be used as a single failure criteria in this case. Instead, we can use here the forming limit diagram, which is a diagram between the major principal strain and the minor principal strain. This region presents the positive values and this region presents the negative values. Okay, basically we can find out that the values of epsilon major, which is the maximum principal strain, are always greater than epsilon minor. By definition, this is the major and this is the minor. Uh, epsilon major uh, always positive, but epsilon minor may be positive, may be negative. Uh, even if epsilon minor have values and absolute values that may be greater than epsilon major, it's still minor because we consider the negative value. So we are not comparing the absolute values, we compare considering the negative value. Okay, let's turn back to the uh, structure here and the stamping uh, metaforming process. In the past, we used to make a circular grid test to draw the forming increment diagram. So uh, in this test, simply we draw circles here, circular grid all over the structure. And uh, after, the, after the forming uh, process uh, is carried out, we see or monitor the behavior of the circle at each region. So here in this region, we may have a state of uniaxial stress. In this region, we have uh, a compression stress. In this region, we have a uh, biaxial state of stress, and so on. So the first case here is the uniaxial state of stress. And in this case, if you monitor the behavior of the circle, let's say this, this region uh, exposes a uniaxial tension. So here is a major epsilon, uh, and uh, you can basically see that it's a positive value. And if we have a normal stress here, uh, so we have a compressive uh, epsilon or compressive strain here in this direction. So this is why we have an epsilon minor that is uh, is as negative because it's compressive uh, strain. Because this is a case of uniaxial tension. We have uh, normal stress in one direction and it will lead to a compressive strain in the other direction. So this is the case here in uh, the uniaxial tension. The other case is the piaxial tension on which we have a balanced stretch. We have two uh, normal stresses and apparently they are equal to each other so it results in a uh, pi axial or uh, balanced stretch just like here so if we saw here a circle in in this shape so it's indications that this region exposed pi axial tension stress okay uh, this region is not visible because uh, in this region, the values of epsilon major will be larger than the values of epsilon major, and this cannot be uh, in our case. So this is not uh, visible in this region, or any point located in this region is not uh, visible. Okay, so any point located in this line is a point of uh, uniaxial state of stress, and any point located in this line is a point of piaxial state of stress. Okay, what about this line? What about this axis? The epsilon major. Any point located in this uh, axis, a uh, plane strain. The epsilon major here uh, is zero, while epsilon major uh, is positive. So if we if we show if we uh, so a circle here that behaves in this manner, we say that the region here in this uh, or or this region exposed to a plane strain state of stress. Okay. Uh, 
maybe those, those three points are the basic principle points to draw the forming limit curve, but we have another case, the case of pure shear, where while we have, have no normal stresses, and uh, in, we will find that this case will be similar to uh, this, as a, the uniaxial tension, but the compressive stress or the epsilon measure in this case will be equal to the epsilon measure. So in this case, epsilon measure is equal to make negative epsilon measure, and this is a reflection of pi axial tension because in pi axial tension, epsilon measure is equal to epsilon measure. So here, epsilon measure equal epsilon measure on this line. This is a formula of y equal x. And here is y negative x. So here epsilon measure is equal to negative epsilon measure. And here epsilon measure is equal to uh, negative 2 epsilon measure. Okay. Another case here is that uniaxial compression. We may find some regions here in, uh, in, in the in the structure exposed to any axial compression. In this case, we are afraid from wrinkles because wrinkles uh, appear when as uh, a region uh, when, when when the material is exposed to any axial compression. In in the, in the case of any axial compression, we have here in in one direction a compressive load. As a lateral plan, we have uh, we, have, we have no normal stress. So this will lead to a compressive strain that will be larger than the uh, the lateral strain or the epsilon major uh, yet it's larger as an absolute value but it's still negative so epsilon major is still greater than epsilon major so, see so we can present this uh, relation between epsilon major and epsilon major in this line as y equative y equal negative half x so epsilon major is equal to negative half epsilon uh, major okay this is region of wrinkles but we should we should note that it's not uh, a must if if we plotted the epsilon major and epsilon major plots and one of those points uh, located here in this region this is not a must that uh, a wrinkle will 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 occur it's it's, it's only an indication that there are a tendency for wrinkles in in uh, wrinkle formation in this region of the material of this structure so you should uh, take your precautions and if we make a proper fixation here or a proper support for this region, we may prevent wrinkles from uh, creation. Okay, let's now turn it back to the basic question. We are making, we are doing all this and we are plotting the forming limit diagram to set a freely criteria based on which we can predict the material behavior, based on which we can say whether the material will fail or not. Until now, we draw the forming limit diagram and we cannot uh, set the safe zone and the failure zone. So let's delay talking about it a few minutes later and see another technique to draw the forming limit diagram. We talked about the circle grid test, but nowadays we are using a different kind of test. We use Nakajima test, or also called the Dawn test, and Erickson test, and also called the Cup test. Okay, both tests are so similar to the deep drawing process. Here is the plank, and here is the plank holder, and there is a punch. And this time we are driving the plank uh, not not for making a deep drawing process, but to create a crack or a split here in the material. Okay, this Nakajima test or Erickson test is carried out on uh, those specimens, and each specimen uh, we repeat the Nakajima test many times to have an average value. So each a specimen of those specimens provokes the material to behave in one of those states. For example, this is the state of uniaxial tension. So when we make the Kajima test using this specimen, we drive the material to behave as uh, as if it's uh, behave in uniaxial tension. And here we drive the state of the pi axial tension. So we are provoking the material to behave in the way uh, we need it to behave to capture the behavior in this state. So. Um, Every time we use Nakajima test on, the, uh, on one of those specimens, we repeat the Nakajima test uh, many times to have only one plot. So this is only one point. This is uh, maybe resulted from four or five Nakajima tests uh, using uh, this specimen or carried out on this specimen. And this point may be uh, generated by making four or five Nakajima tests using this specimen. And the other specimens are uh, presenting the state of stress located here from uniaxial to uh, pi axial. May, uh, for, for example, this is maybe the case of plane strain. And this is maybe cases of a stretching. Um, in general, we called any point here a case of a stretch and the 
any point here a case of drawing so this is drawing and this is stretching because here we have a major epsilon and epsilon minor equal zero but any point after this point epsilon minor will have a positive value so this is a case of stretching and here epsilon minor have a negative value so it's a case of drawing so uh, to, to conclude, the Nakajima test, for example, or, or whatever, uh, we also have Ericsson, we also have Macriniac, all those uh, techniques to make or to draw the four McLemmon diagrams. Uh, we repeat, we repeat the test for each of, the, of those specimens uh, three times, three times, three times, three times, and so on to provoke the material to behave in a uniaxial tension here and to biaxial tension here. And those points uh, between uniaxial and biaxial located in this region. Okay, after finishing the Kajima test, we can have here three points. Each point represents a state of stress. This is uniaxial, here is the plane strain, and here is the pi axial tension. By connecting those three points together, we can uh, have this curve in red. This curve in red is called forming limit curve. Okay, so this is this graph is a forming limit diagram, but this curve in red is forming limit curve, and obviously it splits the forming limit diagram into two regions. Any point uh, be, uh, below the forming limit curve is considered safe, while any point plotted on the forming limit curve or beyond the forming limit curve is considered not safe because yielding or necking will start occurring uh, when the point reaches this region. So the forming limit curve here is the forming or the, or the failure criteria we were looking at all the time. So this is the forming limit curve here and um, as, a, as a margin of safety, we should make an offset here is about 10% of the values of the forming limit curve. So we, uh, we need to make an offset here and we need to draw another forming limit curve uh, here below. We will not uh, call it forming limit curve. We will call it the safety or the safe margin curve to uh, guarantee that, the, that any element must be uh, away far from the nicking region. Okay, let's recap all we uh, discussed in the forming limit diagram. This is the state of uniaxial tension. Again, here is the circle. Uh, if we are using the circle grid test, this is a circle and there is the epsilon major in a positive value and epsilon minor in a negative value. If we, um, uh, if we need to present or if we uh, want to, pre to, uh, to have a better presentation for what happened here. Let's uh, draw the more circle. So if it is a uniaxial tension, then sigma 1 have a value, but sigma 2 equals 0. Uh, this is the case here. This is the element. We have a uniaxial stress in one direction, and the other direction, the sigma is 0. So this is the case here. Sigma 2 equals 0, and sigma 1 have a value. So this is the principal strain. This is the principal plane, and there is a principal uh, 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 stress. This is sigma 1 is the maximum principal stress. In this case here, the relation between epsilon major and epsilon minor uh, it will be like this. Epsilon major equal negative 2 epsilon minor, because it's uh, simply y equal negative 2x. Okay? Uh, and negative 2 is the slope of this uh, line. Okay. Uh, here we have a term that we need to discuss, epsilon t. Okay, um, all this time we are we are talking about epsilon major and epsilon minor as if we have an element of the sheet metal that is supposed to um, a planar stress. We have uh, a sigma x and sigma y, and uh, so we have epsilon x and epsilon y and epsilon z. Epsilon z here is epsilon t. T uh, is for thickness. Okay, so epsilon t plus epsilon major plus epsilon minor must all equal zero. From this relation, we can predict that epsilon t equal epsilon minor in this in this line in this relation. Uh, epsilon major versus epsilon minor here in the case of uniaxial tension. Epsilon t or the strain in the thickness will be equal to the epsilon minor based on the relation between epsilon major, epsilon major, and epsilon t. Okay. The second case uh, where was the pure shear. Here in the pure shear, in this point, we have, uh, or in this plane, we have uh, two normal stress, sigma 1 and sigma 2, and they are equal to each other and have, uh, one of them have positive uh, sign and the other have the negative sign, so they cancel each other. So in this case here, we have a plan of a pure shear, 
look at this point at this point sigma average equals zero because those values are equal uh, uh, but have a negative but have one of them have a negative sign uh, so in this case uh, we only have a shear and sigma average which uh, indicates the normal stress is zero so this is why we call the, this state of the stress a pure uh, shear in in this case we will find that epsilon measure equal negative epsilon minor because the relation here between epsilon measure and epsilon minor will will be like y equal negative x so any point in this line it will have the same value same absolute value for epsilon measure and epsilon minor but because we are in the negative region uh, so the relation will be y equal negative x or epsilon measure equal negative epsilon minor Okay, uh, back to the relation, epsilon measure plus epsilon minor plus epsilon t equals zero. So epsilon t in this case will be equal zero. So this is the only case at which there will, no, there will be no strain in the thickness or in the z direction. Uh, this is why the pure shear case is very critical because any case in this side to the right will have epsilon t uh, um, less than zero and any case to the left will have epsilon t above zero so this is the, re this is the reason why uh, the more we are getting to the left we uh, approach the wrinkle tendency region okay uh, another case here is the uniaxial compression uh, at, we, at which we have only um, normal stress in one direction, so sigma 1 here equals 0, and sigma 2 here uh, have a value, but it's a negative value because it is compression. In, in this case, sigma average will be sigma 1 plus sigma 2 over 2, and this is sigma average, and this, we have here is a shear stress at this point equal the sigma average. So here, epsilon measure equal negative uh, uh, half epsilon minor, so it's like y equal negative uh, half x this is the relation y equal negative half x or epsilon measure equal negative half epsilon minor any points located in this line will follow this relation okay back to the relation epsilon measure plus epsilon minor plus epsilon t should be equal to zero so in this case epsilon t will be half epsilon minor in this case so this is this will be uh, the epsilon or the uh, the indicator of the strain in the z direction in this case. Okay, uh, the case of a plane strain here. This is the uh, infinitesimal element. We have two uh, normal stresses in both directions, but uh, epsilon minor resulted from this case will be equal to zero, as uh, shown here in this figure. Okay, so epsilon t will be equal to negative epsilon major. This is the case here of the Mohr circle. We have uh, uh, two values of normal stress. This is sigma 1 and here is a sigma 2. And this will result that epsilon minor will be equal to 0. The final case here, uh, or the last one, is the pi axial tension at which we have two normal stresses. Uh, this is the case is the reflection of the pure shear. Here is the relation is uh, epsilon major equal negative epsilon minor, but here in pi axial tension, any point located on this line will follow the relation epsilon major equal epsilon minor, and accordingly, epsilon t or the strain uh, on, on the thickness will be equal to negative 2 epsilon minor. In this case, more circle is not a circle anymore. It is a, it's a point. And the uh, epsilon maximum will be equal to the epsilon minimum. And this is the, the only case uh, we have here that have no uh, uh, shear stress and have no, uh, there is no more circle uh, because the epsilon maximum equal epsilon minimum. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, Reaching this point, I think uh, we can make another uh, conclusion. Uh, this is the Nakajima test, or the specimens of the Nakajima test. This one, obviously, is the one that can trigger the case of uh, ten tensile or uniaxial tension. And this is the case of pi axial or balanced uh, uh, pi axial. And those specimens uh, are arbitrary specimens varying between uniaxial and pi axial. After making as a, as a, after carrying out the Nakazima test for each specimen, each specimen uh, will, we will make, as, as we said previously, Nakazima test more than one time to have uh, more uh, than one point here. We can have the average point here in the axial, average point here, 
in a point in intermediate between uniaxial and the planar strain. And here is the planar strain. Here is another one intermediate between planar strain and pi axial. This is stretch, say, let's say this is stretch one and this is stretch two. Then by connecting those points together, we can have the forming limit curve. Okay. Okay, this, uh, this curve generated by Nakajima test, um, specifically the section based. We have two, uh, two ways to measure the, the relation between major and minor strain. Uh, the section based, we have here a section right in the middle and offset about 10% uh, to the right and to the left and measure the values in each time. Uh, here we can we can predict easily that it is a case of a planar strain because the minor strain is about uh, zero is almost zero uh, all over this section line. So in this case we we can predict that this is a case or this region exposed to the plane strain. This is a major strain and this point uh, this point and this point can uh, present the point of the plane strain case and uh, if we make this. Uh, is an Nakajima test many times on this specimen, for example, or in the case of planar strain, for example, we can get those points and we can get the average point, so we can get the point representing the case of the planar strain. We're repeating this each time at every point here, from the uniaxial to the pi axial. Then we, by connecting them together, we can uh, have the forming limit curve. Uh, the other way is the time-based, section-based or time-based, uh, discussed in detail in the standard ISO 12004. Okay, after, after making the numerical analysis, uh, we plot the major and the minor strain relation for each element on the system. And here, uh, this is a forming limit curve, and obviously those points beyond the forming limit curve are considered not safe. So we can here predict that this metal forming process will not work and we should make modifications to make this metal forming process work again. So those points are safe. They are varying between uh, near the uniaxial state and near the biaxial state. Obviously, there are no uh, plots here in this region, this region of wrinkles. So I, I guess if we just make some modifications here in this point, in this local uh, problem here, we can, we can uh, prevent these points from uh, exceeding the forming limit curve. Okay, sometimes in your finite element solver, uh, you have two choices. The first choice is that the forming limit, you have already the forming limit curve, so can you, you can import the forming limit curve to the finite element solvers. Other choice is to use the uh, formula integrated in the finite element solver uh, that um, depends on the value of T, the thickness of the sheet, and the hardening exponent of the material. It's, for example, 0.5 for aluminum, 60. Uh, 61 uh, and the Langford coefficient of anisotropy and anisotropy as we know anisotropy indicates uh, the how the material behaves in all directions if the material behaves in the same way in all directions it's called isotropic material but most of the materials behaves in an, an, an anisotropic uh, behavior so this is the Langford coefficient r and also it's a function of the material it's a property of the material so knowing uh, t and n and r we can have uh, the forming limit curve without making Nakajima test but it uh, you should remember that it's uh, just a rough estimation and the better way is to make the forming limit curve yourself or uh, depend on a pinch mark that already used the Nakajima test to have the forming limit curve for the material you are using in the material uh, metal forming process. Okay, I uh, I prefer here to present uh, this uh, this process. This is uh, ISF or incremental sheet metal forming. I uh, I just want to show the forming limit diagram. In this case, after after making uh, simulation, we can we can choose here the uh, sorry we choose here the forming limit diagram. We choose here the part okay, and we selected the thickness 1.788. It's actually all. I think it uh, was uh, three millimeter and uh, N exponents according to the uh, aluminum uh, we used it was about 0.335 uh, and then we click plot it plots all the major uh, major true strains for each element in the system and you can see here that we are way far from the safety margin let alone the forming limit curve. Okay, I hope you enjoy this session. In this session, we try to make um, a brief 
uh, introduction about uh, concepts related to material failures that may be very useful to uh, those who use finite image solvers like ANSYS or Elastina. I hope you enjoyed the, the video and if you have any question, please uh, feel free to write it down. Uh, you can search for Design Online Academy on Facebook and on YouTube using the same, the same title, Design Online Academy. Okay, thank you and meet you in another session.